and a lot of mistakes will be made along the way, and this was definitely true in I hate when they use the word mistakes, and then what they're actually talking about is mass death. That's insidious, the way that they try and minimize what the actual mistakes were. So this is Luna Oi's most recent video. What did Lenin say about democracy? Democratic centralism series. I know I'm gonna be real mad watching this video. Let's go, let's do this. Hi, I'm Luna. Welcome back to Luna Oi. This is part three in my series on democratic centralism. Unrelated to any actual commentary about like her political positions, I think it's funny how wholesome the intro is. It feels like a show that kids would watch where she has like a talking pet hamster. You would not think this is a political channel from the intro. It's Blue's Clues or Tankies. You're so f***ing right. Magdalena Eye. This is part three in my series on democratic centralism. There are links to parts one and two in the description, but to recap what we've learned so far, every group of human beings, including organizations, communities, and governments, has characteristics of democracy as well as characteristics of centralism. What? Democracy deals with representation of the people in making decisions and directing the group. What Wait, that's not true. This is already off to like a really fucking wild start every group every group has characteristics of democracy what were the characteristics of democracy in nazi germany this is one of my big problems with democratic centralism as a concept they say democracy as long as there's one body even if it's a completely unelected body that is not accountable to the population whatsoever as long as they vote amongst themselves it still has characteristics of democracy but that's not what democracy is. While centralism refers to unity in thought and action in a group, democracy and centralism mutually impact and develop one another, and both democracy and centralism can have positive and negative characteristics. Good democracy can help build good centralism by building harmony and productive unity in thought and action among group members. Good centralism can develop democracy by making sure everyone can have a voice and can comfortably place trust in a democratic system. And of course, the opposite is also true. Bad forms of democracy will degrade centralism as unity dissolves. And bad centralism can undermine democracy what? by putting too much power in too few hands. Marx and Engels define democracy as a system in which the will of the people guides human society through the use of elections and other democratic systems. In contrast, they pointed out that monarchies, feudalism, and bourgeois democracies are not truly democratic at all, since only a small minority wield power and influence in such societies. Marx and Engels saw democracy in all its forms as the primary driving force of humanity. As by that definition, the Soviet Union wasn't democratic either. Like by that very definition, Vietnam isn't democratic. A democratic centralist system, by definition, concentrates the power of the state into a few hands. Like it was actually Lenin who said, there is no freedom until there is no state connected with the tyranny of powerful minority classes, leading to class struggle, which changed and developed human society throughout history. Marx and Engels understood the power of democracy and knew that a working class revolution would have to be democratic in nature in order to be successful. They laid the what? philosophical foundation of starting democracy what? through the lens of dialectical materialism, which paved the way for the development of- Wait, but- Karl Marx literally advocated for the overthrow of the state. I'm so confused how she's coming to these conclusions. Democratic centralism as we know it today. This brings us to Vladimir Lenin, who was the first to define the philosophical concept of democratic centralism based on the- Wait a second. Marx was, wasn't a status as bad as MLs would want him to be? Yeah, no, no, 100%. It's, it's crazy groundwork laid by Marx and Engels in the analysis of democracy. Like Marx and Engels, Lenin was a scientific socialist. This means that he used dialectical materialism as a philosophical framework for fulfilling the mission of the working class in dismantling capitalism and building communism. 
Scientific socialism upholds democracy as the basis for successfully overthrowing capitalism, and Lenin fleshed out these ideas in both theory What? and practice. In the revolutionary proletariat and the right of nations to self-determination, written in 1915, Lenin wrote, "The proletariat cannot be victorious except through democracy." By giving It's just bizarre to me how disingenuous that she's being. We're not even that far into the video, and already. It doesn't make any goddamn sense, and I'm not even defending the monarchy in Russia. But wh how is it demo? Like, why would they need to kill the czar's children in a democratic action? That doesn't make sense. Giving full effect to democracy, and by linking with each step of its struggle, democratic demands formulated in the most resolute terms. Lenin, like Marx and Engels, considered the masses of the people to be the makers of history, not any heroic or divine individuals. Under capitalism, just as with previous forms of class society like feudalism, the majority. Oh, by the way, very funny contradiction in Marxist thought, or tanky thought, I should say, is this idea that it's the masses of people that make history and move society forward, but do not. Do not criticize the handful of guys who did more than the masses. Apparently, never criticize them. You cr you you say the wrong thing about like Marx or Lenin or Stalin to this crowd, and they will never shut the fuck up. Yeah, people have to struggle against a minority ruling class. This struggle between classes, based on a desire for increase and improve democracy, is what has driven human society through every stage of development, from slave societies to feudal societies, and on into the current stage of capitalism. Through all the history of class struggle, democracy has always been both a battle slogan and a revolutionary goal for the oppressed classes. What distinguishes capitalism from previous forms of society is the nature of class division. In previous society, power and other characteristics were distributed among a variety of classes, including monarchs, slaves, peasants, nobles, religious leaders, merchants, crafts. See, I see, I see when tankies use this as the model to show people、um, either capitalist society or feudal society. But how does this pyramid structure? For the division of class society, look any different from society in any of the Marxist-Leninist states that currently exist. You could very easily replace the the church and the king with the Communist Party, replace towns merchants and craftsmen with like the national bourgeoisie, and then replace replace the one lower than it with like party members, the, the lower ranks of the parties, and then replace serfs with the working class. Doesn't even it, like. Come on, man, and so on. Capitalism has reduced the complexity of class structure, so that today the vast majority of humans compose one class, the working class, and a very tiny minority of individuals, the capitalist class, control society. If the working class could manage to overthrow the capitalist class entirely and build a democratic system that represents the will of the working class as a whole. Then class struggle will be eliminated. Oh yeah, I, I did love in the earlier frame that fucking Reddit. Reddit rules you. Reddit is part of the ruling class. Using corporate Memphis in a democratic centralism video is fucking wild. The struggle towards achieving that goal can only be achieved through socialism, and socialism must do all we can to put power in the hands of the working class. Lenin put it very simply in an article called "All Power to the Soviets," published in 1917. Democracy is the rule of the majority. But it should be pointed out that this rule of the majority doesn't mean oppression of marginalized minorities. All working-class citizens must have a voice and enjoy freedom in order for a society to be called a real democracy. According to Lenin, an organization or society must have the following of four characteristics in order to be truly democratic: equality of all citizens under the law, political freedom for all citizens. Decisions made by a majority of all citizens. Citizens decide by vote, which is、What? the essence of peaceful, pure democracy. Does anyone else ever feel like when you have to listen to tankies talk about politics, you're just being consistently gaslit?
Like having Luna Oi, who stands of Vietnam, North Korea, China, Cuba, put up a thing from 1919 by Lenin, where it says that decisions made by a majority of all citizens is a core tenet of what democracy is. Democratic centralism inherently puts power into the hands of a very few people. It puts it into the hands of the Politburo and the Central Committee of a Communist Party. It's not rule by the majority. It is very much a rule by the minority. And the point in their own thought is that the party represents the will of the people. But it doesn't. It's not elected. No one has decided that. And they can make any changes that they want, regardless if it's a good decision or if it's even a popular decision. If these four criteria are met, then a society can be said to be truly democratic, according to Lenin. Lenin developed this criteria for a true democracy through his revolutionary work in Russia, not just through theoretical hypothesizing, but through practice as a revolutionary leader and organizer. But Lenin also knew that in order for democracy to be used to empower the working class and fight capitalism, it has to take a certain form. Lenin argued that in our current stakes of development and material conditions, in order to enable the working class to overthrow capitalism and build towards communism, democracy must take the form of a government. So Lenin believed that the task of communist revolutionists was to develop a form of government which would give the working class access to true democracy while still being able to fight against capitalism, imperialism, fascism, and many other threats to the revolution. Lenin called the form of government which the working class would use to fight capitalism and build democracy and power for the working class, socialist democracy, or proletarian democracy. Lenin famously described the socialist democracy as a dictatorship of the proletariat, but this term is awfully highly misunderstood. When Lenin talks about the dictatorship of the proletariat, he doesn't mean we should have a tyrannical or authoritarian government. He was... Okay, so... I'm, I want to do a bet right now that she is not going to talk about how democratic centralism has a ban on what they call factionalism. So, chat, what this means, let's say you are a member of the Communist Party and you are representing them at the Central Committee and they're currently having their party congress, they're making the decisions on what the party believes and what policies that they want to implement in the future. And one of the policies being voted on is whether or not homosexuality should be legal. Now, this is just an example. It could be anything. It, you could put abortion there, um, interracial uh, relationships, literally anything could fit in this category. I'm just using homosexuality as an example. It gets voted on. And the vote passes that homosexuality should be illegal 51 to 49. As a result of that, you would not be able to, as a member of the Communist Party, be able to say, I disagree with this policy. Because if you publicly disagree with the policy after it's put forward, um, you are engaging in factionalism which means that you are an enemy of the party and you need to be immediately excised from the party. This is part of the reason that I quit the Communist Party in the first place. Simply inverting the idea of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, aka the bourgeois democracy. As Marx and Engels had explained, in the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class holds all the power. Therefore, a small minority have power over the vast majority of workers. The dictatorship of the proletariat, on the other hand, would put power in the hands of the vast majority of people in society. The working class would have a power over the capitalist class, which would have society to begin fulfilling the four criteria of a true democracy. Let's compare bourgeois democracy with socialist democracy, one criterion at a time. Equality of all citizens under the law. Under a bourgeois democracy, there is no equality of all citizens under the law. Capitalists can hire expensive lawyers, what? pay off politicians to lobby. She's living in a country that doesn't have same-sex marriage. Fuck off. It's such a misunderstanding of both what the law is and just incredibly disingenuous. She's literally hung out with far-right nationalists who did gas attacks against queer activists. 
She wants to talk about equality under the law as a prerequisite for what a socialist government is. Copying and bribes and gain all kinds of legal protections through corporate structures. Meanwhile, workers have a very few resources to protect themselves and bourgeois legal institutions offer them fewer protections and benefits. A socialist democracy would truly protect all citizens equally. Every citizen, no matter how poor, should have the same protections and benefits under the law. Political freedom for all citizens. Under a bourgeois democracy, capitalists have far more freedom than the working class. For example, look at freedom of speech. Capitalists have far more of a voice in capitalist society. Where they can I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure all of the labor organizers in Vietnam and China and Cuba, they get beaten down by the cops in the name of protecting the state, have political freedom. Because they went against the one union in their country that is controlled by the state. And own entire media institutions and pay to have their propaganda disseminated to millions upon millions of people. Workers have much smaller voices and also like access to other basic freedoms, like freedom from poverty, preventable disease, and houselessness. A socialist democracy would give an equal voice to everyone, and every member of society That's fucking wild. So, when I visited China, I made a friend. She worked in a noodle shop. Um, the noodles were quite tasty, by the way. And she could not afford to live on her own anywhere in Beijing because the prices for rent are way too high there. So she had to live in a worker dormitory with dozens of other workers. Uh, these prerequisites disqualify any of the countries that she says are socialist as being socialist. And if she were, if you were to push her on this in the slightest, She'll drop the Stalinist act and she'll start weaponizing like Western liberal id poll. Like she'll just start saying, well, you're not Vietnamese, so you can't make a comment on this. They would enjoy the same freedoms and benefits with protection from the government. Nobody would have more freedom than anybody else just because they are more wealthy. Didn't she do this to Vosh? She did. And that's how I know she isn't a Marxist because the workers of the world have no country. You can't just weaponize national chauvinism like that. Private property. Decisions made by a majority of all citizens. In a bourgeois democracy, the capitalist class controls society. Elections are illusionary in nature. They exist to make workers feel like they have a voice, when in reality the capitalist class controls all aspects of government. The working class may have some token input. But the working class will never be given the power to make any decision, which would jeopardize the power. How is she describing a system that is any different from the system that she lives under? This is exactly how these states operate. I mean, yeah, it's not true of local ones. It is true of federal elections. But I wish that they would just be honest. The dishonesty is part of the reason why after several years of being a Marxist-Leninist and being a proud member of the Communist Party, I ended up quitting. Because they're constantly lying. All of their recruitment tactics are based on lying and giving these snuff propaganda pieces that never tell you the full truth. Like, in my opinion, if you are, if you're looking to make a change in the world, and you meet up with people like Luna, and you're taken in by it, you probably have a good heart. You probably want to see the world be a better place. But if you continuously learn about Marxism-Leninism and learn about the in intricacies of all of the things that that movement is responsible for and what they actually advocate for, you're only staying if you're an ideologue. At that point, people generally leave. The exodus I saw in the Communist Party of Canada was because of the people who had been there for several years and decided to start looking into things. Um, they, they decided to start looking into things. And the more you look into it, the harder it is to tolerate Marxist-Leninists. They've done some heinous shit, and they're constantly lying. Power of the capitalist class. 
A socialist democracy would allow every member of society to have an equal voice in decision making. Nobody would be excluded from participating in collective decision making just because they are poor or otherwise marginalized. And the government would be truly be in the hands of majority of society, the proletariat. Citizens decide by vote, which is the essence of peaceful, pure democracy. As I've already said, elections in bourgeois democracies are not real. Decisions aren't really made by popular vote, and representatives don't really represent most people. Capitalists control and rig elections in any number of ways, through spending vast fortunes on political propaganda, through gerrymandering. So I want to give you all a history lesson chat. Some of you may know, and others may not know, where the term tanky actually comes from. And I think that this is important particularly important because earlier on in this video, Luna references Lenin's work on the rights of nation to self-determination. In 1956, the people of Hungary wanted independence. They wanted to form their own government. They wanted to be separate from the Soviet state. The Soviet state responded to the burgeoning independence movement in Hungary by rolling tanks in and crushing all dissent in Britain, there was a schism in the Communist Party of Great Britain between the people who supported the Soviet line and the people who were opposed to the Soviet line. And the people who were opposed to the Soviet line started calling the pro-Soviet side of their party tankies. And that is the origin of the term tanky. It was members of a communist party that opposed the Soviet Union, crushing the dissent of a nation that wanted independence. Mandering and redistricting, through lobbying, campaign contributions, and other sorts of bribes, through corporate media, and in a million other ways. A socialist democracy would empower workers through more meaningful forms of democracy. It should not be permitted to bribe politicians and political leaders in any way. And every citizen, no matter how poor or marginalized, should have the same access to elections and other democratic structures as everyone else. Once full socialism is established, then a society can then begin transitioning towards the stateless, classless society, which is a dream of all comers. Oh, oh my god. It's crazy how they think that they can get away with this stuff. As if this isn't, this hasn't been the lie for so long that these, these states are going to somehow transition into communism just by magic. It's a pipe dream. Like, look, many people didn't know about this, but in a, in Khrushchev's speech in 1980, he said communism in 20 years. We are strictly guided by scientific calculations, and calculations show that in 20 years we will build a main we will build mainly a communist society. Like they were making promises like this. Well, I guess when 20 years they were actually correct. The state did dissolve. So you know what? Khrushchev W. Unfortunately, getting to full socialism is a very long process, one that takes many generations. And so far, no country on earth, not the Soviet Union, not Vietnam, not Cuba, not any other country has yet achieved full socialism. Lenin knew that it wouldn't be possible to simply throw the socialism switch, especially in Russia, where yes. centuries of rule by the Tsar left the Russian people poor, uneducated, and indoctrinated into reactionary belief and ideology in countless other ways. Building a socialist democracy will be a very difficult task for any nation. And a lot of mistakes will be made along the way. And this was definitely true in I hate when they use the word mistakes and then what they're actually talking about is mass death. That's fucking insidious, the way that they try and minimize what the actual mistakes were. Russia. For instance, Lenin knew that the Russian people would need to be educated about democracy. Previous ideas about democracy and self-determination, which were established and disseminated by the capitalist class, would need to be fought against and negated. In Russia, that meant fighting against Tsarist indoctrination. In former colonies like Vietnam, that has meant undoing decades of colonialist propaganda. In capitalist nations, that would mean fighting against ideas of bourgeois. Okay, so... I'm no Vietnam expert, but I'm ac okay. Also, why is the freedom convoy on screen? I, I, I just got jump scared. What I was saying is 
Now, I'm not a Vietnam expert, but as far as I'm aware, Vietnam was not even, um, it wasn't even a democracy by name before the Vietnamese Revolution. So what, demo what ideas of democracy was the capitalist class teaching the Vietnamese peasants? Bourgeois democracy, which hold back the working class and hinder the development of socialism. Today, just as in Lenin's time, there are many misperceptions about democracy, just as there are misperceptions about socialism. A lot of people fall for capitalist lies. They believe that bourgeois democracy is good for the people, and they fall for the scam of capitalist-controlled elections, thinking that their votes actually matter in the bourgeois democracy, when, in reality, capitalists actually control the agenda of society behind the scenes. Today, workers in bourgeois democracies are also led to believe that since socialists and former socialist nations like the USSR, Vietnam and Cuba have never been perfect, and since we have what? never achieved full socialism, we are complete failures and liars. For instance, a lot of Western leftists argue that Vietnamese communists are lying about wanting to build communism, since we have yet to achieve- Yeah, I feel like I'm watching a poorly made second thought video right now. But I really want to know in what way Vietnam is materially different from a capitalist country. As I, I don't believe that it actually is. The only thing that they lack is liberal democracy. They have an authoritarian top-down system, and I'm not shilling for the West by saying that. Obviously, Western nations also have a very top-down system, but it feels like the only... The main difference is literally that they don't have elections. If a stateless, classless society, and because our road towards socialism has been very difficult, with many mistakes and setbacks along the way. The expectation is that we just need to push the socialism button and all the problems will disappear. They don't realize how many problems we face and how many internal and external threats we have. That okay, that's a skill issue. If I was the president of Vietnam, I would just press the socialism button. I mean, she just said it exists. Press the fucking button. Make it very difficult to achieve our dream of building socialism. The problem here is that they treat socialism and democracy as an idea rather than a practical process of development. Lenin, however, was quite aware that building towards full socialism and create a true socialist democracy would be very difficult. Socialist democracy is a brand new form of government, something that humans have never tried to build before in all of history. And it will take a lot of experience. I want to say something that has been bothering me for years now about Marxism-Leninism, and you can really tell in their worldview with what Luna's saying right now. She's talking about a government that formed over 100 years ago and using language like something that human beings have never tried to build before in all of history. One of my biggest problems with Marxism-Leninism as a worldview is they're so focused on the future, but they live in the past. They're looking for their idea of what the future is supposed to be by looking into the past. It becomes tradition. It becomes conservatism. They, yeah, they view history like it started in 1850. in all of history, and it will take a lot of experimentation and failure to achieve it. We can't simply think of socialism and democracy as utopian ideas, but rather as pragmatic systems which must be built over time through scientific development, which unfortunately includes a lot of trial and error. Building socialist democracy is a process of constantly developing theories and then applying them creatively in real life in our struggle for socialist revolution. Of course, this struggle has to be systemic and organized. There has to be an underlying framework for developing theories and testing them in the real world. We have to have a shared set of values, principles, and characteristics, which we apply as we build towards socialism. And this is exactly what Lenin succeeded in developing in his formulation of the philosophical concept of democratic central before we dig wait a second i need to i want to correct the record here because i know this is wrong
One sec. Also, I saw someone in chat say they're bored. Please entertain them while I look up some boring ass nerd shit. Give me a second, mom. Mom, I'm owning the tankies. I'll be I'll be out in a sec, mom. What the f okay i actually don't even know what i was all of my all of my history shit is all mushed together in my head Deeper into Lenin's formulation of democratic centralism, it's important to understand that democratic centralism actually has a few different definitions. First, there is a philosophical concept of democratic centralism. This is simply the recognition that democracy and centralism exist in all human groups, and that democracy what? and centralism have a dialectical relationship with one another. They mutually impact and develop each other over time. The philosophical conception of democratic centralism is universally applicable to all human groups. You can use this philosophical framework to study and analyze all- I gotta say, this is the most boring Bill Nye video I've ever watched. It's so, it's, it doesn't even have music. And it needs to like, it needs to cut to a bunch of kids. Uh, who are like really fucking jazzed about democratic centralism just like every like 15 minutes Human groups of all forms and sizes for instance You can do a democratic centralist analysis of a family or of a political party or of a government or of the entirety of human civilization I guarantee you no one does this and she's just making shit up No one has ever done a democratic centralist analysis of their family you can study the democratic centralistic properties of not just communist parties, but of fascists, of liberals, of monarchies, of any group of human beings. This is the philosophical foundation from which Lenin formulated as a more specific set of democratic centralist guidelines for political parties. You can think of this democratic centralist guidelines as a philosophical framework to help guide communist political parties toward revolution. And then- God, this is such nerd shit. This reminds me of when, um, when I was still part of tanky Twitter and I saw this one tweet where it was like some like 19 year old or 18 year old was saying like just got into a fight with my family trying to explain democratic centralism to them. And I'm just like, why are you trying to explain to your family how a communist party functions and how that's somehow relevant to anything that they would ever possibly need to know? Why did it cause a fight? And to have communist governments build toward a fully socialist democracy, as we build toward socialist democracy, step by step, we can use these guidelines of democratic centralism to ensure that our democratic forms and our centralist unity mutually develop one another to make our organizations and government as strong as possible. Finally, at the most specific level, there are specific implementations of democracy. Oh my God. I, they they literally put them all up. I see the Communist Party of Canada logo. Come the fuck on. Democratic centralism, which are adopted by specific communist parties, governments, and other organizations all around the world. These can vary pretty widely from place to place. Hold on a second. I actually, I need to see something very quickly. I'm sure, um... I'm sure the Communist Party of Canada is outraged that their logo has been used without permission. Let's see what they've said on Twitter. Oh. Well, now we have their full statement. And over time, for instance, the democratic centralism of Vietnam has changed significantly over time. At first, way back in the 1920s and 30s, there were various communist parties, unions, and organizations which had different implementations of democratic centralism. Over time, these groups came together to form what we now call the Communist Party of Vietnam. The democratic centralism of Vietnam has also changed significantly from wartime to the subsidizing model era, to the early Doi reforms, to today's socialism-oriented market economy era. 
The announced democratic centralism today differs significantly from the implementation of democratic centralism in China, Cuba, and other socialist nations. What? Why? Wait. Why is there a? Why is there just a random break in here? This isn't. This isn't even a live stream. If you find the ideas presented in this video interesting or of value, might we recommend Luna's translation of the Vietnamese curriculum on dialectical material? Oh my God. It's available now at banyanhouse.org slash shop. Okay, wait, I need this book. I actually, I need it. I gotta see how bad it is. I mean, I already, hold on a second. Oh yeah, I read theory. I definitely read theory. I got everything I need right here, baby. It sucks. Like, she took one university course in Marxism-Leninism. By the way, I actually took an online course in socialism with Chinese characteristics from a Chinese university. So I'm as qualified to speak about all this shit as her. And I know it's all fucking nonsense. This credential is actually less useful than having a degree from McDonald's Hamburger University and working class paths to socialism. Lenin believed that many philosophers and leaders were diverging from the basic principles. It's so fucking dull and it's such bullshit. She literally says in the video, um, it's the masses that create history. And then the entire video is just Lenin said this, Lenin said that, Lenin said this. Let us worship the great men of history who actually make history. It's a Marxism. For instance, the German social democrat Edward Bernstein sought to collaborate with the capitalists and believed that socialism could be achieved through reform within yeah, the- Yeah, God, this propaganda is drier than Ben Shapiro's wife's vagina. Bourgeois democracy. Other popular philosophers who Lenin believed were misleading the working class included Ernst Mach, Karl Kowski, and Mikhail Bakunin. There were also other large factions such as the Mensheviks who wanted to abandon Marxist proletarian revolution in favor of other divergent philosophies. Lenin wanted to unite the working class through principles of Marxism, but he wanted to achieve this unity through democratic means. In order to achieve this, Lenin sought to build a Marxist political party which could lay the groundwork and help to educate the masses, not in an authoritarian, overly centralized way, but in a way that dialectically developed centralized unity alongside democratic principles. As Lenin wrote in the original version of the article, the immediate task of the Soviet government. Freedom of discussion, unity of action. This is what we must strive to achieve. Beyond okay, okay. This is a classic uh, tanky tactic, by the way. If you ever see tankies pull a quote up and you see the ellipses, that's them cutting out a specific part of the quote. And a lot of them do this very intentionally. So for instance, um, there's a quote from Albert Einstein about Lenin. And tankies love to use this quote, but there's always an ellipsis in this quote. And the reason why is because uh, Einstein says, I do not like Lenin's tactics. So they cut that part out in order to just have the parts where Einstein is saying nice things about Lenin. On the bounds of unity of action, there must be the broadest and freest discussion and condemnation of all steps, decisions, and tendencies that we regard as harmful. Only through such discussions, resolutions, and protests can the real public opinion of our party be formed. Only on this condition shall we be a real party, always able to express its opinion, and finding the right way to convert a definitely formed opinion into the decisions of its next Congress. Lenin realized that the Russian Revolution held great historical importance. The Russian people were at a crossroads in deciding how they would develop the very first socialist nation on earth, and nobody knew what ideas would work in practice and which would fail. In order to test theory against reality, Russian communists would have to have an organization, a structure, and a philosophical framework which would offer as much participation for the masses as possible while staying true to the principles of democracy and social struggle, first laid out by Marx and Engels, and they would have to do this in a society which still had a powerful bourgeois class and many reactionary tendencies left over from centuries of Tsarist feudalism. 
as Lenin said in a speech at the Congress of Economic Councils in 1918. We have begun. It's actually so frustrating too. It's like, why they do this thing over and over and over again, where they only mention shit from like 1916, 1917, 1918. And then they say, oh, but it's also developed and changed over time. But they never get around to how it's developed and changed. And it was learning about how all of this stuff developed and changed that made me distrust Marxist-Leninists in the first place because it's disingenuous. They, these systems have fundamentally altered themselves over the course of 100 years, but they do this hero worship for shit that happened over a century ago. It's literally just like right wing people and standing the founding fathers. Gun this historical epic, an epic in which we are breaking up the discipline of capitalist society in a country which is still bourgeois. And we are proud that all politically conscious workers, absolutely all the toiling peasants are everywhere helping this destruction. An epic in which the people voluntarily on their own initiative are becoming aware that they must not rely on instructions from above, but on the instructions of their own living experience. This is a task of enormous difficulty, but it is also a thankful one, because only when we solve it in practice shall we have driven the last nail into the coffin of capitalist society, which we are burying. So Lenin believed that the people must guide their own revolution. It was, therefore, the task of the Socialist Party to give power and a voice to the people while educating the working class and raising class consciousness. Thus, the party must have a dialectical relationship with the working class. The party can't simply rule the working class from above, nor can the party simply follow the working class along reactionary lines. The party and the people must develop one another, and the way that they would do this was through the process of democratic centralism. This required a great deal of discipline, theoretical knowledge, and practical experience. If the party and revolutionary leaders become too autocratic and commandist, forcing decisions upon the working class against their will, then democracy will fail and the revolution will collapse. Possibly I I, I'm actually just, I'm more mad at her now than I was before. Cause it's like, who is this content for exactly? I don't even understand. Fully becoming a dictatorship. If, on the other hand, centralized unity and harmony in theory and practice are neglected, then the working class will splinter and fracture into infighting, giving opportunists the opportunity to take advantage of democracy to put the bourgeoisie back in charge of society. There is no specific prescription of democratic centralism which anyone can follow at any given time. You can't just follow a checklist of rules and regulations in applying democratic centralism to the development of human organizations. That's true because it's not meant to be developed. It's not meant to be applied to human organizations. It's literally just for communist parties. Why does she have to try and make this deeper than it actually is? This doesn't make any goddamn sense. But she's also in such a good position with her audience because she can say whatever she wants. And then if anyone pushes back in the slightest, she'll just be like, well, you're not Vietnamese, so shut the fuck up. You have no say on this. And also everything that I'm saying is different in Vietnam. Instead, revolutionists have to constantly analyze the current situation and make corrections, recognize mistakes and failures, and look for opportunities to foster the mutual development of both democracy and centralized harmony. That said, Lenin did offer some basic principles of democratic centralism, which he presented at the Second Congress of the Communist International. The participants at this Congress wanted to build an international alliance of socialist revolutions, and Lenin proclaimed that. Parties joining the Communist International must be built on the principle of democratic centralism. Lenin's suggested principles thus became the charter of the Second Congress of the Communist International. The actual document is pretty long, so I will just give you a brief summary of each principle of democratic centralism. And I will link to the full document in the description if you want to give it a read. But before we begin, remember, there is a difference between these guidelines for the implementation of democratic centralism for communist parties and the more universal philosophical concept of democratic centralism. So don't get confused. 
the principles of democratic centrism for communist parties, which Lenin laid out in the Second Congress of the Communist International, are specific guidelines for the application of democratic centralist philosophy to the organization of communist party. Okay, with that being said, here are the 10 principles of democratic centralism from the Charter of the Second Congress of the Communist International for Communist Parties. Number one, the grassroots party organizations are the organizational core of the is she ever going to say, like, none of this stuff is even useful for understanding democratic centralism if you're only going to talk about stuff from 1918? It's crazy to me. It, it, it feels like um, my brain is leaking out of my ears trying to listen to this because none of this is useful information. The party. This is very important. It means that workers must control the party at the ground level. They don't. The centralized national body must subserve to local grassroots organizational levels. They levers. aren't. This gives the structure of a democratic centralist party sort of inverted pyramid. This is literally, it's literally the opposite. It's literally the fucking opposite. It's not, th this is not how this looks. You flip it upside down. Like, Jesus Christ. It's the, it is a pyramid, but she, she's literally doing it backwards. Like, look, this is what it actually is. Okay. How many, how many lines we got here? One, two, three, four, five. Fuck it. We don't need that many. In the top one, you have the Politburo. In the next one, you have the Central Committee. And then in the bottom, you have the local party cells. And that's it. This is the structure of the Communist Party. All power in a democratic socialist organization is centralized into fewer and fewer hands going up the pyramid. And a communist party is not accountable to anyone outside the communist party. They have full power in any country that they govern in. Number shape, where grassroots local organizations are the core basis of power in the party. Number two, all higher organizations. And the local cells are the only ones that might get vote. No, the local cells, they don't vote. Workers don't vote people into the local cells. The local cells vote people into them. It's the opposite must be elected are responsible for reporting on their work and can be so like when they're saying democracy and stuff like all higher organizations must be elected are responsible for reporting on their work and can be dismissed they're only talking about within the party they're not talking about democracy in a country they're literally just talking about the democratic procedures inside an authoritarian party that is not accountable to the population be dismissed this one is like even in like by this definition of democracy, Nazi Germany was democratic because Hitler had the breaking vote between the three people who directly reported up to him. It's really obvious. No high position should simply be appointed or selected arbitrarily. All positions and organizational structures should be elected with the ultimate power of voting held at the local grassroots level. Number three, the party is an organization of independent workers who are educated on social democracy. The party is well, not a true. special class of people. That's it should be composed true. of workers. And these workers must be educated in the principles of scientific socialism, including democratic centralism. Number four, the autonomy of all communist parties must be recognized. No nation's communist party should have the power over the communist party of any other nation. The communist So like... I want to actually bring up a quote. This is from State and Revolution by Vladimir Lenin. The higher phase of communist society. So he quotes Marx. In a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and with it also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a livelihood, but life's prime want, after the productive forces have increased with the all-round development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois law be left behind in its entirety, and society inscribe onto its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. 
And Lenin comments on this by saying, only now can we fully appreciate the correctness of Engels' remarks R mercilessly, mercilessly, ri <clears throat> mercilessly ridiculing the absurdity of combining the words freedom and state. So long as the state exists, there is no freedom. When there is freedom, there will be no state. Parties should be autonomous and allowed to build socialism based on their own material conditions. Number five, all party members must eliminate the competition for territory between different parties and overcome the fear of other parties. This is especially important in the earlier stages of revolution, when various communist parties will no doubt exist in different regions and cities. These parties must find ways to work together and, ideally, come together in unity over time while combating reactionary and opportunistic parties and individuals which seek to restore power of the capitalist class. Number six, there must be organizational unity. And at the same time, there should be purely ideological struggles between different social democratic ideological trends. This is already a lie. Democratic centralism, pro pro democratic centralism prohibits factions. You cannot have different ideological struggles or different ideological trends. There's only one line that everyone needs to follow. Trends within a party. There can't just be one single ideological prescription which all members must follow blindly. That's literally what democratic centralism is, Luna. Members of the party must be allowed to hold ideological differences. They're and not allowed. They're not allowed in any party. This is what democratic centralism is. Freely voice their opinions and concerns in party meetings and when solving problems, which must be balanced. I feel like Walter White in the fucking back of the car just screaming, Luna, Luna, please. With the goal of developing centralized unity and harmony in ideology and action over time and eliminating bourgeois influence and sabotage within the party. Number seven, clearly identify the causes of contradictions among ideological trends within the party because it is a necessary condition for a healthy development of the party in order to educate the working class and avoid errors in policies. Just as it is important for different ideological positions to be held, it is also important for the party to have an introspective awareness of these different tendencies. We can't just pretend ideological differences don't exist. Instead, we have to work tirelessly to understand the nature of ideological differences in order to negate internal contradictions as smoothly and harmoniously as possible. Number eight, in ideological activities, it is necessary to point out which issues are in agreement, which issues are still in disagreement and to what extent. The party must get rid of the old habits, such as to accuse other people without sincerely and thoroughly analyzing dissenting opinions. It is easy for members of the party to opportunistically attack one another and to arrange themselves into factions. Some members may try to- Toxic femininity in Vietnam? I just got this card. What in the fuck is this? Hold on a sec. What? Build their own personal power base and so division within the party- What in the fuck did I just get recommended? for their own personal gain. This must be strictly prohibited, and disagreement must be worked out in good faith, with the ultimate goal of building unity and harmony in the party. Number nine, provide party members with sufficient documents on party activities so that party members can independently study the disagreement in the process of party decision making. This is pretty simple and pretty important. Party activity must be documented, and documentation must be disseminated to all members so that every Imagine like some tanky being like, wow, this is so true. I didn't know this. I didn't know that members of a political party are given documents related to that political party. Wow, this really opened my eyes. No one, I did not think that this was the case before watching this video. Everyone can know what's going on at all times. Number 10, the party must discuss as widely and openly as possible all the issues and resolutions. Party members must have a complete self-conscious and critical attitude towards the party's resolutions. The party must create conditions for party members and workers' organizations to understand and to express their agreement or disagreement with the party's situations and resolutions via discussion, newspaper, group meetings, and etc. Nobody should simply blindly follow the party. The party's action and decisions should be constantly criticized by the membership. Okay, fuck it. I can't, I can't, listen. I need to put it at 1.5 for the next 10 minutes. I need this to end. I need this to fucking be over. But I don't want to miss anything. 
to identify mistakes, clarify positions, and maintain an efficient path towards socialism. Oh, that's so much better. Okay, so this should give you an idea of the guidelines Lenin suggested for the implementation of democratic centralism for communist parties. Lenin based his principles on the philosophical foundation of democratic centralist philosophy with the goal of maintaining the freedom to discuss and disagree within the party while simultaneously developing unity in action and ideology over time. In a well-unified party, the ideological struggle must not be used to divide the party, nor to destroy the unity in action of the proletariat. Instead, disagreement and ideological struggle should be used to unify the party and the working class and to develop democratic structures. This is very important to understand. It's hard to even, like, do really good commentary on this video because it's based off of a flawed premise in the first place. So everything that comes from that premise is also wrong. Like, it just, from the gate, established that this entire video is wrong. It's flawed. Stand because disagreement and debate and internal divisions can easily be used by opportunists to build their own personal power, to undermine the proletarian mission of building communism, and to develop splinter groups which seek to disrupt and sabotage the working class from within. You see this a lot with Western leftists who use debate tactics and sophistry to sow chaos and division within the. <laughs> I love the idea uh, that Vosh, because this is definitely about Vosh. I love the idea that Vosh is uh, sowing chaos and division within the working class by doing YouTube live streams. And the average worker in the United States would be like, who the fuck is Vosh? Working class. The goal of democratic centralism- I'm sure, I'm sure tankies are doing a much better job by bringing uh, people over to their side by saying shit like, Joseph Stalin did nothing wrong and having like Stalin profile pictures. That's definitely the way to reach people is to elevate disagreement and debate so that it positively develops the party and the working class as a whole. It's entirely possible for disagreement and criticism to be constructive. After all, we need to be able to identify flaws, mistakes, and weaknesses so that we can fix them and make our revolution stronger. This is why Lenin believed that disagreement and freedom of dissent within the party is so important. But if disagreement and criticism are used cynically and opportunistically, then they can quickly become destructive. So the goal of socialists must be to use democratic centralist strategies and tactics to use disagreement, dissent, and critique to the betterment of the revolution while restricting people from using disagreement and dissent as weapons against the working class. In Lenin's time, there were many people who were opposed to the principle of democratic centralism. Some of these critics claim that Lenin was too anarchistic and not centralistic enough. For example, in 1917, the bourgeois- Hold on a second, I need to woke scold Luna Oi for a second. Did anyone else realize that this video doesn't pass the Bechdel test? Like, there are no women quoted? Luna has not brought up a single woman? Wow. Cannot believe this. The provisional government of Russia was against the seizure of land by the peasantry. The provisional government wanted the land distribution to be worked out through compromise between peasants and landlords. Lenin strictly opposed this and supported the seizure of land and redistribution directly to peasants without compromising with landlords. Lenin wanted power in the hands of local peasants, and he believed that this would be the best basis for a national government which could deal with issues of land and justice for peasants. Other critics claimed the opposite, that democratic centralism was an authoritarian philosophy which sacrificed democracy at the expense of centralism. One such faction which accused democratic centralism of being too authoritarian was the Federalist. The Federalists call for a system which is purely democratic without centralism. Basically, the Federalists call for quote-unquote decentralized system for decision-making, in which participants could voluntarily submit to the system, but they could leave at any time. The idea is that oh everyone should be able to enter or leave the system at any time, and for any reason, and that centralism could thus be eliminated altogether, leaving a pure democracy. The mistake here is pretending that centralism is somehow inherently bad, or even something that- With how much she goes on about white men, I totally see why she ended up hooking up with EJ. Can and should be avoided altogether. The fact is, centralism is present in all human groups. Even federalist systems have to have some degree of centralism, or they simply fall apart into countless splinter groups with no cohesion whatsoever. So, opposition to the very concept of centralism is really just individualism. Democratic centralism takes the more realistic and practical position that centralism will always exist in any group of human beings, and that we should therefore try to understand the role of centralism plays in society and how centralism interacts with democracy. As revolutionary movements develop and advance, the dynamics between democracy and centralism will constantly be changing, and it's the job of every revolutionary to study the relationship between democracy and Centralism, and to try to constantly develop and improve both democracy and centralism in the road towards socialism, to fight against false accusations of authoritarianism, and in writing his first draft of the immediate task of the Soviet government. Those who oppose democratic centralism always suggest autonomism or federalism as opposing alternatives and consider those to be a solution in opposition to the instability of democratic centralism. But in fact, democratic centralism does not eliminate nor exclude anarchist autonomism. On the contrary, it includes the necessity to have autonomism internally. The same is true. What do you think happened to EJ? Like something's going on. Federalism, democratic central. Yeah, like the something is going on with EJ, and I don't know what. I really want to know. Like he just like completely bailed from the internet, but you still catch glimpses of him, like him doing the voiceover for this video. Who the fuck is EJ? Non compete. Non compete is an an former anarchist, I think tanky now YouTuber, who moved to Vietnam to be with Luna.
socialism could be applied within federalism, and federalism does not inherently oppose democratic centralism. In a true democratic regime, federalism is just a transitional step towards true democratic centralism. The federal system does not in the slightest contradict with democratic centralism. In a true democratic regime, federalism is often only a transitional step towards genuine democratic centralism. There's no bigger mistake than mixing democratic centralism with bureaucracy and dogmatism. Now our immediate you literally cannot have democratic centralism without bureaucracy. It's literally a method for organizing a bureaucratic system. It just doesn't make any goddamn sense. Like, this is also the problem with only quoting Lenin from a hundred years ago when talking about this. Because when you do that, people are going to make the assumption this is how the current systems function. But they have changed and warped over time. And in a lot of places, it's just indistinguishable from what it was supposed to be. The immediate task is to practice democratic centralism in our economy and to uphold and allow local groups to develop their own ideas and express their own ideas as we move toward a common goal. Surprisingly, Lenin was not opposed to most of the basic principles of federalism, especially in the early stages of revolution. The principles of democratic centralism uphold autonomy and grassroots organization as vitally important. So Lenin did not really disagree with the federalists as much as the federalists said he did. However, one way in which Lenin strongly disagreed with federalists was their lack of adherence to socialism. Lenin believed that the only reason socialists should have a revolution and build a democratic centralist government to begin with was to build towards socialism and socialist democracy. The federalists, on the other hand, did not believe in any one unifying goal or vision for society, and Lenin believed that this gave opportunists and capitalist agents opportunity to disrupt the revolution and seized by control of society. Since centralism was discounted and disregarded and even denied by the federalists, there was no explicit ambition to build to it's, it's the, this is what I mean when I say that it's fucking wild to, on, to try and teach people about democratic centralism while only using stuff from 100 years ago. Like, in this history lesson where you try to explain to your viewers what democratic centralism is, how do you explain... Um, because, okay... In the original conception of a communist party, it is a party that represents the will of the working class people. It does not have mass elections where people vote for who is in the party. The party does all of its elections internally. But that's, in their worldview, okay, because they still represent the will of the people. But then you fast forward like a hundred years, and now you have Jack Ma, like... I think he's like the biggest billionaire in China, or one of them at least, as a member of the Communist Party. It is not, it's, it's not like a huge deal anymore for capitalists to be part of the ruling party. It doesn't make any sense from their own worldview. But that's why they have to focus on stuff from 100 years ago, because actually analyzing the current material conditions and how things have changed makes it makes you realize that their ideology is Swiss cheese. There's so many holes in it was harmony, unity, and centralization of thought and action. Without a centralized goal for eliminating capitalism and building socialism, the working class was splintered into countless factions. Democratic centralism is simply a process of uniting disparate factions together under the common cause of overthrowing capitalism and building towards a socialist democracy in which- And that's also not even true because as what I learned in the Socialism with Chinese Characteristics course that I took at a Chinese university, the goal of the Communist Party is not overthrowing capitalism. The goal of the Communist Party of China is quite literally building capitalism. That's why when I was debating the Yankee Tanky, I was talking about the primary contradiction in China. And the current primary contradiction in China is between the needs of the people of China and underdeveloped productive forces. Quite literally, they want to build capital. They want China to be a more advanced capitalist nation. That is the current the current goal of the party. It's not about overthrowing the capitalist society. They want to be a better, more advanced capitalist society. Every single person has a voice within a self-determining government. In the early stages of revolution, principles of democratic centralism must be used to guide parties towards growth and acceptance among the working class. Disparate parties must then find ways to work together and merge together over time until enough cohesion and power is developed to seize control over the state from the capitalist class to institute the dictatorship of the proletariat. Once the dictatorship of the proletariat has been established, the principle of democratic centralism must then be applied both in the organization and operation of the whole socialist government, the entire political system, and also in the management of the nation's social economic processes, with the ambition of building towards socialist democracy. I should note that no nation on earth has yet made it all the way to socialist democracy the soviet was it the confucius institute no Tsinghua university they have a socialism with chinese uh they have a socialism with chinese characteristics course that i took online 
the union never fulfilled all of Lenin's criteria of democracy. Vietnam today is still in the process of building two a socialist democracy, and we have a long way to go. It's actually very difficult to build a socialist democracy because of all the threats and challenges faced by the capitalist imperialist world. I have a few videos on many of the challenges and setbacks Vietnam has faced. But suffice to say, it's really hard to build a fully functioning socialist democracy. If it were easy, I'm sure someone would have done it by now. And if you think it's easy, it's such it's such a cop out. It's such a cop out. Because they're basic, they're saying like, oh, we can't develop a full socialist country because all of these capitalist imperialist countries are going to thwart us. Oh, I know. I have the idea. Let's also become capitalist and imperialist. Then we can develop into more socialist or even more faster. It doesn't make sense. Then I hope you will stand up and lead your people to full socialism and show us how it's done. Anyway, even if you disagree with the principles of socialism, communism, Marxism, Leninism, and so on, you can still use the philosophical framework of democratic centralism to analyze governments, political parties, and other groups of human beings. That's because democracy. So it's not a philosophical framework. Once again, like it is literally an organizational model. It is used for organizing a communist party. It's crazy that she's trying to make this more deep than it actually is. Democratic centrism is, at the core, simply the recognition that democracy and centrism exist in all groups of human beings, and that democracy and centrism mutually impact and develop one another over time. As Lenin said, democratic centrism is not a principle that exists exclusively for communists. It is, in fact, a recognition of basic fact about reality, which any group could apply in developing their goals. Okay, so now you have a basic understanding of Lenin's formulation of democratic centralism, and the application of democratic centrism for communist parties. Okay. That was painful, but I think there's like a, re there's a real reason why this part of YouTube is dying because they say so much and they have no substance behind the words that they're saying and over time people realize this if you're like an ml a tanky whatever the fuck you want to call the red fascists if you're part of that group you eventually see the pattern over years that it's the same marxism leninism 101 thing over and over again because the more you actually know about all of the deeper stuff, all of the intricacies of that ideology, the more you realize how full of they all are.